When it comes to true crime, Mark Twain was right. Truth is stranger than fiction. But it's also more dangerous, and real-life horror stories don't only spread fear, they can also spread rumors, often making it difficult to discern fact from fabrication. April 1873, Kansas, there was unfolding the story. That would leave a local family with a nickname that remains infamous almost 150 years later. This is a story of the bloody banders, lured in tired travelers who were hoping for a place to sleep and got much more than they wanted. Their life was connected with the founding narratives of the American West, a place where Anglo settlers so a future rich with possibility, with few structures related to class, family background or law to hinder them. Having plundered this land from its original inhabitants, the American government turned it over to thousands of poor immigrants who sought to make their names and fortune on stolen land. Some people found the American dream, some people found poverty. And at least 11 people, probably more, found death at the hands of the Bender family. The Bender's family was one of the families who moved to the outskirts of Kansas. John and Elvira and their two children, John Jr. and Kate, ultimately settled down near Cherwell City, intending to run an inn. The German background of the family was apparent from the way they were talking. John and John Jr. were the first of the family to come to the property and create a small cabin. The man also redeemed the land into a sizable barn, so that the women of the family could follow them and settle down. Keeping mostly to themselves, the Banders appeared to simply be struggling settlers who worked hard to earn their living. John Bender was 60 years old when he arrived his wife about 55. Standing over six feet tall, John was a giant of a man who, because of his piercing black eyes set deeply under huge bushy brows, earned him the nickname of Old Beetle Brow John. He was described as a wild and woolly looking man. Mrs. Bender, a heavy set woman, was so unfriendly and had such sinister eyes that her neighbors began to call her a she-devil. To add to her first look, Ma Bender also claimed to be a medium who could speak with the dead, and boiled herbs and roots that she announced could be used to cast charms or wicked spells. Her husband and son were said to have feared her as she ran the household with an iron hand. John Bender Jr. was a tall, slender man of about 25 who was handsome with fox-colored hair and mustache. Speaking English fluently with a German accent, he was said to have been social, but he was prone to laughing endlessly, which led many people to think of him as a mentally deficient. The star of the family was Kate, an attractive 23-year-old who spoke English fluently and worked as a self-proclaimed healer and psychic who held seances, claimed to cure illnesses and gave lectures on spiritualism. She was quick to laugh and talk to strangers. With her brother John, they often attended Sunday school and uh, were lightly accepted in the community. The little beauty had a desire for fame and often stand up for free love and excuse for murder in her lectures. Along with her desire for fame, she also created wealth and position. Though her beauty and social skills gained her popularity with the locals, her actions began to cause them to say that she was satanic. It was to be this tiny band of family member that would take most of the blame of what was soon to be found out about this unfamous family. When the Banders opened their store and inn in 1871, many travelers would stop for a meal or supplies. However, some of those men, who frequently carried large amount of cash with the intention of selling, buying stock or purchasing a claim, began to go missing. When friends and family began to look for them, they could trace them as far as the Big Hill Country before they could find no trace of the lost traveler. These first few missing travelers 
didn't raise an overall alarm in the area, as it was not uncommon during those days for men to simply continue their journey westward. As more time passed, the disappearances became more frequent, and uh, by the spring of 1873, the region had become strife with rumors, and travelers began to avoid the trail. As people continued disappearing after visiting the Bender's home, the surrounding communities began to grow suspicious. After one family went missing in the area, their friend, Dr. William York, came to the area to ask if anyone had seen them. After Dr. York himself went missing, his brother, a military man, came to the Benders Inn asking about his brother. The Benders told York that his brother had probably been killed by the Native Americans in the area. Even Kate, with her visionary abilities, attempted to search for the missing doctor to throw any suspicion of herself. But York's investigation uncovered several people who claimed that the Benders had threatened to kill them. When York returned to the inn to confront the Benders, he found it lonesome. York's party then searched the building for any sign of what happened. What they found was a scene of such blood that should Stephen King himself have written it as fiction, critics may have called it far-fetched. When the men arrived at the property, they found the cabin empty of food, clothing, and personal possessions. They were also met by a terrible smell inside the slan inn. Trap door nailed shut was discovered in the floor of the cabin. Pran it open, the men found a six foot deep hole that was filled with clotted blood, causing the terrible smell. However, there were no bodies in the hole. Finally, the men physically moved the entire cabin to the site and began to search below, but no bodies were found there either. Continuing, they began to dig around the cabin, especially in the area the Benders had used as a vegetable garden and orchard. At the site of a freshly stirred depression in the earth, they found the first body, buried head downward with its feet slightly covered. The corpse was that of Dr. William York his skull bludgeoned and his throat cut from ear to ear. The digging continued the next day, and nine other bodies and numerous dismembered body parts were found, including a woman and a little girl. The burial site was christened Hell's Half Acre, and brother of Dr. York, a lawyer and state senator, residing in Independence, offered a $1,000 reward for information leading to the Banders family's arrest. On the May 17th, Governor Thomas Sosburn added to that amount by offering a $2,000 reward for the apprehension of all four. A manhunt was immediately launched for the murders. Word of the gruesome murders spread fast and thousands of people flocked to the site, including news reporters from as far away as New York and Chicago. The Bender cabin was ripped apart by gruesome souvenir hunters right down to the blood bricks that lined the cellar. Bit by bit, the story of the Benders was pieced together. The Benders were obviously not what they appeared. In fact, they weren't even a true family. The only ones related were Ma and Kate Bender. The family scene was divided by a closed curtain from their living room. When a guest arrived, they would be seated at a place of honor facing away from this curtain. Kate would then distract them with conversation while one of the other banders approached the curtain. With the victim's head outlined through the thin cloth, one of the banders would smash their skull with a hammer. Once the body was in the basement, the bloody banders, as they later became known, would strip it of any clothes and valuables and bury it in a mass grave. Money was suddenly part of why the bloody banders decided to start killing their victims. For all these deaths, the banders gained only about $4,600, two teams of horses, a pony, and a saddle. But many of their victims were poor, which suggests that the family simply enjoyed killing. The banders wagon was soon found a few miles away from their home. The family themselves had disappeared. Some thought they might have been killed by vigilantes, and others that they had left the country. Some say that John Jr. and Kate traveled by railroad to an outlaw colony near the border of Texas and New Mexico, 
where law enforcement wouldn't go. One detective even claimed to have tracked John Jr. to the border and found that he died of apoplexy. Meanwhile, there were reports that Ma and Pa Bender had fled towards St. Louis, Missouri. For many years after the crimes, two women traveling together would be accused of being Kate and Elvira Bender. And so, several vigilant groups would claim to have caught and killed the Benders, none provided evidence or claimed the cash reward. So, the tales of what happened to the Benders can only be speculated as to their accuracy. The fact that 10 bodies were found on the property is not disputed. Other corpses found in the area, as well as the many mysterious disappearances of other lonely travelers, led the locals to believe that the Benders actually killed more than 20 people. While the fate of the Bender family may never truly be known, the bloody Benders live on in a legend, a real-life horror story forever rooted into the collective memory of the Kansas Plains and beyond. Thank you for watching my young detectives. Write what do you think about this case in the comments below. See you in the next video. Bye.